This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to break down the rules for Commands and Colors Tricorn. Commands and Colors Tricorn was released in 2017 by Compass Games and designed by Richard Borg. This game supports two players and takes from an hour to an hour and a half to play. Tricorn's blocks are divided into four types, Infantry, Cavalry, Artillery, and Leaders. The base game provides three factions involved in the war, the Continentals in light blue, the British in red, and German mercenaries in dark blue. Infantry, Cavalry, and Artillery are collectively referred to as Units. Units are groups of soldiers each having four blocks. Leaders represent a sole individual with one block. Although leader blocks bear no specific names, they are often designated to important historical figures in the game's scenarios. However, regardless of their identity, each leader has the same attributes. These unit types are further segmented into classes. In the base game, cavalry and artillery are only represented by light classes. Infantry, on the other hand, has a multitude of classes. Let's begin by taking a closer look at infantry units. Infantry units have the greatest variety in Tricorn. They represent two distinct groups, professional soldiers and civilian recruits. Infantry units are ranked into a hierarchy of color-coded classes based on their military experience and specialization. A unit's nameplate color indicates the unit's place in this hierarchy. Professional infantry has three classes, elite units in red, regulars in blue, and light units in green. Civilian sourced infantry fall below professional soldiers in the hierarchy. They are represented by two classes, provincial units in brown and militia units in yellow. Many of these classes contain several different infantry units within them. I'm going to showcase a distinct member of each class to illustrate their advantages and disadvantages. An infantry unit exhibits their training in two ways, physically with their combat abilities and mentally with their morale. Each of these areas translate into how an infantry unit performs in the game. Let's look at the combat area. First is the unit's movement ability. This is the number of hex spaces an infantry unit can move per turn. Most infantry units can move one hex space per turn and battle. However, be aware that moving and then firing is less accurate. The infantry unit that moves and then fires will be penalized one battle die from their roll. The exception to this rule is light infantry. Light infantry is a specialized class that carry less equipment and are trained for mobility. As a result, they can move one hex space and battle without a penalty. Also, light infantry classes can choose not to battle and move two hex spaces. The next two stats under combat are range and strength. As we covered in the first episode, most units can conduct combat in two ways range combat at distant targets, and close quarters combat in targets in an adjacent space with melee. Range, obviously, is tied to range combat. This is the number of hex spaces an infantry unit can attempt to hit a target. Strength is the number of dice the infantry unit can roll to attempt to score a hit. Notice, the greater the range to the target, the less dice a unit typically has to roll. An infantry unit has the greatest strength when focused on their adjacent hex space for a melee attack. Many infantry units also have special training in close quarters combat. This training allows them to score a hit with the saber dice symbol. Let's pause for a moment and look at some highlights in this section. First, elite infantry is very strong in melee and many conduct combat with three battle dice versus the standard of two. Next, you'll notice that light infantry units and militia do not have a saber bonus in melee. Light infantry units are equipped for speed and as a result are not as effective in melee, therefore they do not get the bonus. Militia lack adequate training and experience to gain the saber bonus. 
One other advantage to point out is the light rifle unit's range of four hex spaces. Not all light units have this advantage, but light rifle units are the sharpshooters of the group and are fairly common in the game. Let's take a look at the morale area, which is a major focus in Tricorn. Morale gameplay is designed around how infantry units deal with the horrors of the battlefield represented by a flag die result. Some units, with high levels of training and experience, can ignore flag die results. You'll notice here in the Ignore category that elite units are hardened by their experience with war, and some units can ignore up to two flag die results. Also, light units, when occupying a woods hex, can ignore one flag die result. However, even if an infantry unit resists flags, a player may always opt to retreat if they wish. The next section shows the number of hex spaces the unit will retreat. Professional units retreat one hex space. Civilians with little to no experience on the battlefield will retreat much farther. Provincials, two hex spaces, and militia, three hex spaces. Light infantry units, once again, are unique in regards to retreats. Cavalry and light infantry class units that are being attacked in melee combat may retire and rally instead of standing and possibly battling back. This allows them to proactively retreat without the need of a flag die result. However, when retiring, essentially the light unit is retreating two full hex spaces. And the attacker who is meleeing them gets to roll their battle dice to see if they hit before the retirement. When conducting this maneuver, the unit also receives two additional dice to conduct their rally roll. We'll take a closer look at the retirement and rally ability in the next episode. Finally, when it's time for an infantry unit to rally, a unit's level of training will determine any modifiers to the rally roll. An elite unit may receive up to two additional dice. Units without professional training may have dice subtracted from their roll. This should give you an idea of the advantages and disadvantages of each level in the infantry unit hierarchy. To see the nuances of each specific infantry unit within a level, study the unit reference chart that came with the game. This chart will identify specific units by name with their key abilities versus the overview I've highlighted here. By learning each infantry unit's skills, you can better incorporate them into your overall strategy for winning the game. Following the same layout, let's look at the skills of the remaining units and leaders. Cavalry is one of the fastest units in the game. They can move one or two hex spaces per turn and still battle. The limitation of cavalry is that they cannot conduct ranged combat. They must always engage the enemy in melee combat. Also, you'll notice that cavalry cannot take advantage of the saber die result. And on the morale side of their skills, due to their speed, they retreat two hex spaces. Also, similar to light infantry, cavalry can also retire and rally when attacked in melee combat. Next up is artillery. The core game only provides light artillery. Artillery is obviously cumbersome to move. Therefore, if a player chooses to move their artillery piece to an adjacent space, they cannot conduct combat during that turn. Artillery makes up for this with its impressive range of five hex spaces. Also note, like most infantry, if challenged with a flag die result, they will retreat one hex space. Finally, let's discuss leaders. Leaders are unique in that they represent a sole individual. Leaders on their own cannot conduct combat, but when adjacent to or attached to a unit, they can provide bonuses. However, leaders are highly mobile and can move up to three hex spaces per turn, this ability allows players to move and apply their leader bonuses easily to other units. For combat, when attached to a unit, leaders add one battle dice to infantry or cavalry. Artillery only receive a bonus when conducting melee. On the morale side of skills, leaders inspire the units they're attached to. This allows their units to ignore one flag die result. Also, they add one additional die when attempting to rally. In the event of a retreat, they can move back three hex spaces. In the next section, we're going to take a closer look at leaders
characters and learn more about their various gameplay actions and effects on units. First, let's take a more detailed look at leader bonuses. Leaders bolster the morale of their forces in two ways. First, if a leader occupies the same hex as a unit, they're considered attached. An attached leader provides several bonuses to that unit. The leader adds a battle die to the unit's attack. The unit can ignore one more flag. And this also provides an additional die to the unit's rally roll. Second, when a leader is alone in a hex, all adjacent friendly units without an attached leader can ignore one flag. However, be aware that these abilities do not stack. If a leader is attached to a unit, then all their attention and bonuses are focused on that unit. Adjacent units do not get the bonus of ignoring one flag. Also related to our discussion are some bonuses related to linear combat. Military tactics of the period organized units into lines. Early firearms were extremely inaccurate and by concentrating firepower this maximized the possibility of scoring a hit on the enemy. Also, fighting shoulder to shoulder with your comrades bolstered one's courage, or at least made frightened young men think twice about running in front of their peers. Tricorn reflects this tactic by employing a support bonus. If an infantry unit has friendly units in at least two adjacent hex spaces, then they're able to ignore one flag. Keep this support bonus for linear combat in mind when organizing your forces on the battlefield. Now, at long last, let's discuss how leaders can become casualties. In Tricorn, every unit type has its own face on the die. If a player rolls a die and the result matches the type of unit they're attacking, then they score a hit. However, leaders do not have a unique symbol on the die, so how do you hit and eliminate leaders? Well, the answer depends on whether the leader is attached to a unit or alone. Let's look at both instances. Whenever a leader is attached to a unit, they provide bonuses to that unit. However, this is not without risk. When a leader is attached to a unit and the unit loses one or more blocks without being eliminated, there is a chance that the leader may also be hit. Once the unit tack is resolved and their blocks are removed, then a leader casualty check is made. The attacker then rolls two battle dice. If the attacking player is able to roll two saber die results, then the attached leader is eliminated. When the leader is eliminated, remove their block from the battlefield and the opposing player earns a victory banner. Whenever a leader is eliminated, it sends a shockwave of panic through nearby troops. As a result, the unit the leader was attached to and all friendly units in adjacent hexes must each make a rally check. If a unit fails to roll at least one flag and rally, they're removed from the battlefield. If they succeed in rallying, the unit must then retreat the required number of hex spaces. After that, they do not need to make another rally check. Essentially, this is the usual retreat and rally sequence in reverse. Now, if the unit the leader is attached to loses its last block and is eliminated, then the attacker conducts a leader casualty check with only one die. I call this the sole survivor roll. If the die result is a saber, then the leader is eliminated. If not, then the leader survives. However, they are then considered to be a lone leader. The rules for eliminating a lone leader are different. Lone leaders are subject to an attack just like any other units in the game. If the lone leader is the target of a ranged attack, then it takes two saber die results to eliminate them. If the leader is the target of a melee attack, it only takes one saber die result. In either event, a lone leader that survives an attack must then retreat. Remember, leaders are not affected by flag results. However, the overwhelming scale of an attack will force a leader to retreat one to three hex spaces. The number of hex spaces to retreat is up to the player, but they must retreat at least one hex space. Also, when a leader retreats, they do not make a rally roll. 
Next, let's discuss some unique ways that leaders resolve retreats. A leader that is attached to a unit stays with that unit when it retreats. When the unit finishes its retreat and makes its rally roll, that unit gains an additional die from the attached leader bonus. However, a leader that is attached to a unit that fails its rally check must also make a die roll to see if they route with the rest of the unit. To conduct this route check, the player rolls two battle die for the leader. If they roll at least one flag, the unit routes, but the leader remains on the battlefield. If the player is unable to roll at least one flag, the leader also routes and is removed from the game. When the leader is removed from the game, this also panics all units in adjacent hexes without a leader of their own. These affected units must now each make their own rally check, and if they fail those checks, then they route from the battlefield as well. As you can see from these rules, leaders are very important in the game. While a leader can provide great bonuses to the men they lead, losing a leader can also be disastrous to the men under their command. Now, let's discuss the concept of a leader escape. Leaders can move or retreat up to three hex spaces. This makes them one of the most maneuverable pieces in the game. Leaders also possess special abilities when retreating alone. A leader may retreat through a hex containing a friendly unit, a friendly unit with an attached leader, or a lone friendly leader. They cannot end their movement in a hex with a unit that already has a leader attached, but they may end their retreat in a hex with a unit. At that point, they're considered attached to that unit. A leader may also retreat through a hex containing an enemy unit. However, the leader must then conduct an escape action. When this happens, the enemy unit in the hex gets to roll their normal number of battle dice to try to hit them. And, since the leader is in full retreat, they do not get to take advantage of terrain bonuses. As a result, if the enemy rolls one or more saber die results, the leader is eliminated. But, if the leader is not hit, they get to continue their retreat. Reflecting back on what we've covered on units and leaders, you can begin to see why the Tricorn base game is much more complex than other commands and colors entries. One major point is that Tricorn benefits from the design experience from Ancients and Napoleonics. Many of the rules adopted here are from later expansions in those series. However, Tricorn adopts the leader aspects from these rules at the very start. There is also a much greater focus on the psychological aspect of the Revolutionary War with its numerous morale rules. In fact, many times you'll feel like you're resolving the impact of morale rather than actual combat. This makes Tricorn a very interesting addition to this series. I hope you've enjoyed the second episode of our breakdown for Commands and Colors Tricorn by Compass Games. In the next episode, we will take a detailed look at the steps for ranged and melee combat. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.